So the question arises then, well, okay, so we've got catheter ablation, we've got drugs, we know AF is important, but why do we need surgical options now for AF ablation? And we're entering a very exciting era in terms of the way we treat AF. The recent societal guidelines um, say that, and these are probably going to change again to make this more prominent, but thoracoscopic or hybrid surgical ablation is a class 2A indication for AF particularly in patients who have had failed uh, catheter ablations or symptomatic despite medications. So just to give you some context, as a cardiologist, as an electrophysiologist, what do we do in terms of the cath lab? So what we do well in the cath lab through the groin is what we call catheter ablation, which is essentially where we pass wires from the groin into the heart and we electrically isolate the pulmonary veins. Now, if you remember, the pulmonary veins are the focal trigger for AF. So this is in patients with early AF who have paroxysmal symptoms. And we do this well, and the procedures now are safe and quick. We can, always do, we can also do a catheter maze type ablation, so we do roof lines and mitral isthmus lines. But this doesn't work quite as well, and let's just show you some data as to where we are at the moment. So... Patients with paroxysmal AF, intermittent episodes, success rates are 70 to 80% plus. But with persistent AF, so as they go on to the next phase of the disease, the success rates significantly drop. So a five-year registry study from Hamburg showed that after a single catheter ablation, procedures in patients with long-standing persistent AF, uh, the success rate was only 36% and a large meta-analysis of over 18,000 patients on the right there shows that with one procedure in patients with persistent AF, with catheter ablation, they just don't do well, and the success rate was 43%. In red, you can see what happens when we do repeated ablations and the success rate goes up a little bit, but it's still far from satisfactory. So why is this not working well? We don't have a standardized lesion set. We struggle to achieve transmural lesions in the atrium. And there's a lot of data now that a lot of the drivers for AF emerge from the epicardium, i.e. from the outside of the heart, and we can't target these from the inside. So this limits us in terms of what we can achieve with catheter ablation alone. Again, in persistent AF, there are additional triggers outside the pulmonary veins, so the posterior wall, the left uh, and the left atrial appendage are other important targets which we can't address quite as well. And you'll see here some of the different mechanisms that occur in persistent AF. So patients who are in AF all the time, the left atrium becomes involved, you have rotors, you have um, wavelets, and you have re-entry circuits. So all this is going on in the left atrium, and there's a lot to address. This is a video which shows what happens as the AF progresses. So you've got the posterior wall of the heart, and over time, this stretches. Now, on the sides, you'll see it's limited by the pericardial reflections. So it's a restricted area which continues to grow, and the darker patches here are areas of what we call fibrosis or scar. And we think as the condition progresses, the fibrosis leads to more propagation of AF. So there's a term that says AF begets AF, i.e. the longer someone's in AF, the harder it is to treat. Also, the posterior wall of the left atrium <coughs> excuse me, is a complex structure. It's made of myocardial fibers, which run in different directions. Um, and for, with a catheter, again, when we're ablating at the uh, posterior wall, we're particularly worried about causing damage, causing atriosophageal fistulas, the communication between the atria and the esophagus, which can be potentially fatal. We can't achieve transmural lesions, so there's lots of reasons why we can't target the posterior wall effectively. So just to summarize, as someone goes into persistent AF, there's more of the atrium involved. There's endo and epicardial connections which need to be addressed. And there's a lot more substrate, there's a lot more disease that needs to be treated. More recently, there have been a couple of sub-analysis of large trials which have shown, well, what are the other markers of success in terms of successfully treating someone with persistent AF? And what's come out repeatedly is the bigger the size of the left atrium, the harder it is to get someone back into rhythm. And we've seen this in a few studies as the sole marker. 
So a large left atrium equals poor success rates with catheter ablation. Now, this study, again, reiterates what it shows is registry data, which shows in the cath lab, in the cardiac cath lab, as cardiologists doing catheter ablations, our success rates after one year are at best average. As time goes on, two years and then three years, the success rates continue to drop. So the long-term outcomes are not good, but if we compare this to the gold standard for treating AF, which is the cox made surgical procedure, success rates are excellent in one year, but also, more importantly, they remain in place after several years. So what we're now trying to do is say, well, how can we harness the skills of combining a catheter ablation in the cath lab, but also cardiac surgery, to try and emulate um, the cox maze with non-invasive or non-open chest approaches. And so one of these approaches which we've been running at Bart's for the last 10 years or so is called the convergent procedure. So what is the convergent procedure? Well, this is a two-stage procedure which starts with a minimally invasive epicardial left atrial posterior wall ablation performed by a cardiac surgeon to target those substrates of that posterior wall that we've seen, which is so important in the propagation of AF. This is done with a minimally invasive sub xiphoid approach. And then a couple of months later, the patient comes back for a catheter ablation from the inside of the heart to um, consolidate those lesions. Um, a small graphic of what you see. So again, the surgical aspect of this is a sub xiphoid approach, a small incision, the surgeon then puts an endoscopic um, endoscope into the, pos into the pericardium at the posterior uh, left atrium. And here you'll see the epicense catheter, which is the um, surgical ablation catheter, onto the posterior wall of the heart. You'll see that there's suction, a vacuum, which sticks the um, catheter onto the wall, so we've got good contact. And then you have lesions delivered on the outside of the heart. And on the top of this picture, what you see is the darker lesions there are the radio frequency ablations, which are delivered on the posterior wall of the heart. And you can get contiguous lesions across the posterior wall. So with a catheter, with the best will in the world, we can only get small lesions. But now you've got a contiguous lesion set covering the whole of the posterior atrium through a small incision. So this is just a graphic of the catheter. It's irrigated uh, ablation catheter with suction which sticks it, which helps it adhere to the posterior wall. The energy is directed away from the esophagus, so we're not worried about the risk of atrioesophageal fistulas. And then what you see here is the patient comes back a few months later for a catheter ablation. And on the picture on the right, you see different colors. So red is basically scar tissue. So when we go in and do an endocardial map of the heart, we see that the posterior wall is completely treated, it's completely scarred, and you have hopefully healthy tissue around that. When we perform the procedure, we go around the pulmonary veins again because we know we can do that well. And often these patients come back with what we call atrial tachycardias, which are fast, regular atrial arrhythmias, and we can address those as well in the cath lab. We also perform a, a cavotricuspid isthmus line. So a real comprehensive ablation of the heart, which is minimally invasive. Um, we looked at uh, a retrospective comparison of the conversion procedure versus catheter ablation alone for these patients with long-standing persistent AF. And we said, well, how do they do? And our data mirrored what is published in the literature. So in patients with long-standing persistent AF, with a catheter ablation, they do abysmally. They have a success rate of about 30%. But we can almost double that with the convergent procedure. But this went on one step further. So there was a randomized controlled trial called the Converge IDE trial, looking at about 153 patients, randomized in a two-to-one fashion to the convergent ablation versus catheter-only ablation in the cath lab. And here you see what the study showed. So it took these patients, randomized them into two groups. In the convergent patients, the lesion set was, as you've seen, posterior wall isolation. And then at the same time with the catheter from the leg, the patients had a pulmonary vein isolation and a cavotricuspid isthmus flutter line. So treating atrial flutter and the AF. And the patients who didn't have surgery just had a catheter ablation. They had pulmonary vein isolation and a roof line and a CTI line. 
And the endpoints from this study were looking at, well, what is the freedom from AF or atrial flutter, atrial arrhythmias after a year, which is our standard endpoint for measuring ablation procedures. And the secondary endpoint was, what is the reduction in the AF burden alone at one year? What we saw, and sorry, this is all I wanted to highlight. These patients were long-standing persistent AF patients. So they've been in AF for six years and 5.9 years. So we know that this cohort of patients typically will do really badly with ablations. And again, we saw a significant improvement in patients undergoing the convergent um, catheter ablation versus just uh, standard catheter ablation alone. We saw not only an improvement in atrial fibrillation and atrial tachycardia, but also if you look at AF and freedom from AF, a significant improvement at one year. So in this cohort of patients with long-standing persistent AF, often with dilated atria, we know they do better with more than just a catheter ablation and a hybrid approach. The safety endpoints were good. So a total safety, um, total in incidence of adverse effects was 7.8%. And this was, and in terms of serious complications, there was, uh, you know, a one percent incidence of stroke, which is again in keeping with the data we have from the cardiac cath lab. So I've talked about the conversion ablation. Timo will later come on to talk about thoracoscopic hybrid ablations, which is another way of uh, ablating AF with a surgical approach. But all the data now is pointing towards a hybrid approach to, to AF in these patients with long-standing persistent AF, without question, delivers better outcomes. And these are three of the, the main studies that have been published in the literature recently, all demonstrating superiority. So why does this work? Why is it superior? Well, as I've said, it creates this transmurality, which we can't achieve from the leg, from, from endocardially alone. It, it debulks the left atrium, so it eliminates more of the surface area. And now we're figuring that actually the left atrial appendage is also important in this whole process. And I'll come on to that shortly. So it's this combination of debulking, eliminating triggers, which gives us better success rates with a hybrid approach. So which patients should be considered for this hybrid ablation? Well, patients with symptomatic, persistent, or long-standing persistent AF, who've either failed on antiarrhythmic drugs or failed catheter ablations. And similarly with patients with resistant paroxysmal AF who have failed antiarrhythmic drugs. We know that patients with dilated left atria do badly with catheter ablations, but better with um, hybrid approaches. And patients with AF and heart failure. And patients who are not suitable for this approach are patients who have had previous cardiac surgery because of adhesions um, uh, which limit access to the pericardium. Patients with a significantly dilated left atrium above six centimeters, and patients who have contraindications to anticoagulant therapy. So the final part of my talk is talking about the importance of the left atrial appendage, particularly in the context of hybrid AF ablation, and why this is now becoming a standard part of our ablation procedure. So if we look at the left atrial appendage embryologically, <clears throat> it's a remnant of the primordial left atrium. So it's not, and it's not got the smooth left atrial features, it's complex, and we think that it now is an important driver for atrial fibrillation. We all know that the left atrial appendage in AF is where we get blood clots, and these blood clots can go off and cause strokes. So it's important that we manage it from that perspective as well to reduce the risk of stroke, the most feared complication from atrial fibrillation. More and more emerging data has shown that now, not only does the left atrial appendage a source for blood clots, but it also acts as a source of triggers which drive AF. So is there a way now that we can prevent blood clots from escaping from the left uh, atrial appendage, but also electrically silence it? And will this improve our outcomes from AF ablation? So the interest in the left atrial appendage first began in 2010 as a source of uh, triggers for atrial fibrillation and left atrial firing. And the initial studies showed that, yes, actually in a lot of patients, the atrial appendage is important. And this was perhaps uh, one of, again, another landmark study in 2016 where patients with persistent AF were randomized to two groups, 
One group had a standard ablation procedure, and the other group had a standard ablation procedure, but also what we call electrical isolation of the appendage. So with a catheter, the appendage was isolated. And we see that by disconnecting the appendage from the heart led to a significant improvement in, in reduction in recurrence of AF. And the majority of triggers in the appendage originate from the base of the appendage, so where the left atrium joins the appendage. So we can try and isolate the appendage again with a catheter in the cath lab, but what's the problem with this? Well, we know that there's a high recurrence rate, so we don't do it very well. Um, we can perforate the left atrial appendage, leading to more complications. We can cause phrenic nerve palsy, as the phrenic nerve run, can run behind the left atrial appendage. We can cause injury to the arteries. And also, there's a significantly increased risk of thrombus, because yes, we're electrically isolating the appendage, but the blood clots can still form there and are more likely to occur if it's not moving. So without occluding this, without occluding the appendage and just electrically isolating it, we're potentially increasing risks. But what about occluding it epicardially, surgically? Well, it's a definitive procedure. It doesn't have any of these other risks, and it works really well. This was a recently published trial in the New England Journal of Medicine, of, uh, New England Journal of Medicine where they looked at patients undergoing cardiac surgery who have a history of AF. And the trial was convincing and, and demonstrated that there's a significant risk of a reduction of stroke in any patient with, his, with AF having cardiac surgery in whom the appendage is closed with an atriclip device compared to patients in whom that wasn't performed. So it's a no-brainer in terms of closing the appendage in anyone with a history of AF having cardiac surgery. And we know that the atriclip device is very safe, it works very well, and we can get complete left atrial appendage exclusion. And what exclusion means is we occlude it, so it's, you know, it endothelializes, it disappears, but also it's not electrically active in the vast majority of patients, and all the data is, is, is there, supports this. So as I say, the potential benefit of a Including the LA, excluding the left atrial appendage is we eliminate the risk of strokes and thrombus formation and we also eliminate, potentially eliminate triggers for AF and also debulk the atrium and reduce left atrial mass. So the AMAZE trial was kind as a trial using another technique called the Lariat device and I'll show you this in a second but this is what we're currently doing at BART's. Um, along with the convergent procedure. So we're combining the convergent surgery, the hybrid approach, but at the same time as the surgery, we're now excluding the left atrial appendage with the Lariat device. And the amazing, so just to show you um, a demographic of how we do this. So this is a really, I don't know who, who invented this, but I think, I think it's so clever. Um, so we pass a magnet from the leg, from the femoral vein into the appendage. So this is a, on a long wire that goes into the appendage and you see it here. Now, remember, we've got access for the convergent procedure, that small sub incision that you saw at the beginning, and using that, we pass a second magnet onto the outside of the appendage epicardially. So the two magnets are on the inside and outside of the appendage, and then they connect because they're magnets. What happens next is we uh, deliver a snare over the epicardial magnet onto the base of the appendage, onto its neck, as you'll see here. And we can visualize this on TOE at, this, at the same time. And we can use a balloon as well inside the magnet to make sure that we're at the right place. So we don't want to miss any of the appendage. We want to make sure that we've occluded it all. Once that happens, we tighten the snare. A suture is delivered over that. The two magnets are disconnected. Everything's pulled out. 